so it's fall 2017. I don't remember the month exactly, but we're um, we're in the midst of a season. You know, we're we're starting off the year 10 and 0. You know, getting all the way up to the top five in the country, and video is starting to surface around Dade County of a, of a very special freshman football player. And so I remember, and again, I don't remember when it was, but I remember driving over and sitting in the coach's office at Monsignor Pace High School, uh, and in walks a ninth grader. And instantly, after watching the film and, and seeing this young man walk in in person, you realize at that moment that this is the exact player that the University of Miami has got to sign to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish ultimately at this school. Uh, that day, uh, which ended up being, I think, his first offer, started a relationship with, with James Williams and University of Miami football. Um, that was a relationship with myself, um, Ephraim Bonda, Demarcus Van Dyke, uh, Blake Baker, so many other people here in, in our in our program and in our building. That's four years, you know, four years, the, the, the duration of a recruitment of a player like James. And, and obviously, like our football program, the, the recruitment itself, not without its ups and downs. Um, and that goes for so many other of the, the prospects that are on this list uh, that we're sending out today that we're so fortunate to sign today, and whether that's Leonard Taylor, Romello Brinson, Lawrence Seymour, Lawrence Seymour, who I believe we offered at a youth camp, maybe between his eighth grade and ninth grade year, which sounds crazy. Um, Rashard Smith. I mean, there's so many others. The local recruits that in the past that Miami had been letting slip away. And as we try to make it one of our battle cries this year of just trying to do things that, you know, Miami in its recent history has struggled to do. Um, something we're so proud of, of the, to be able to land the, the quality of player that we're able to land in this class. And then when you factor in 2021 and who knew that 2021 would be recruit, would be defined by a pandemic that completely altered the landscape of college recruiting. No camps, um, no in-person evaluations at spring ball or at fall games, no unofficial visits, official visits, no in-home contact, um, not getting in the living room, nothing. And so ultimately, what did this class come down to? It came down to relationships. Some relationships like James that have been four years in the, in the making. Uh, some like, uh, like our very talented offensive signees who had to make up ground and, and, and Rhett Lashley and Rob Likens and Darren Justice, along the help of the phenomenal Stephen Field and, and Eric Hickson, um, made up for lost time and, and really developed great relationships with the offensive players um, you know, down here that ultimately ended up in our class. And you have to do it through Zooms. You have to do it talking through a box like this, like I'm doing right now, um, or through FaceTime. Uh, just so much of what was normal and how you build relationships in recruiting uh, went out the window. But uh, the relentless nature of, of our staff, uh, through all that, we're really, really proud to, uh, to add this fine group of Hurricanes uh, to our roster. A class that I have to point out that was mostly committed before we'd, we'd even stepped foot on a field this fall. And very much like the 2020 class we signed, you know, mostly a year ago today, they really have one goal in mind, and that's to get Miami back on top of college football. Uh, before I, we start with questions, I just want to I want to thank Andy Vaughn for overseeing our very unique recruiting efforts this year. Um, David Cooney, Demarcus Van Dyke, and Edwin Pata in, in our recruiting office, they have had such a massive impact. It's immeasurable uh, what those three mean, men mean. Um, to our pursuits and, and, and our ability to sign a, a, a big time class like this one. I want to thank Brooke, Brooke Wilson, as always, for her hard work. And I've got to mention Dominique Nwilko for completely transforming our digital content recruiting. It just it was something that we felt like was 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 not where it needed to be. And and, uh, and, and Dominique is just she's she's turned the whole thing around. We're so excited uh, with the impact that she's had on us. And and then just, you know, I want to thank our staff, like I mentioned, our coaching staff who whether it was in quarantine, um, whether it was back in the middle of practice, I mean, whether we got guys that, that are that are you know obviously during during uh, our our little November quarantine, whatever whatever situation it was, they did what uh, what was necessary for us to finish the class. And finally, I just want I do want to thank uh, the signees today. I want to thank the signees for for putting their faith and trust um, in our program, um, and along with their families, I just want to thank them for putting the, their faith and trust ultimately in the University of Miami. And, uh, and then with that, I'll open up with questions. Great. Thank you, Coach. We're going to start off with David Lake from 24-7 Sports. David, go ahead. Yeah, Coach, wanted to go back to James Williams. Um, you know, you mentioned when you first met him that he – it was obvious he's the type of player you got to land to, you know, win the games you want to win. 
in a similar line of thinking, does does signing him today represent, you know, he is the type of player, you know, with winning recruiting battles against major programs that you gotta you gotta win to keep the big time players home. Understanding you're not gonna keep all the big time players home, but the goal is to keep your fair share. Does he kind of symbolize the importance of winning those big recruiting battles here in South Florida as well? David, I think that's exactly it. And and obviously it doesn't start with James. Um, and there are other guys in this class that would that would represent the same thing as guys in last class, you know, whether it's a, a Don Chaney or Jalen Knight, and, and there, there are others. Um, but the idea is that it's more. And the idea is that now that if I'm a ninth grader, I know I can be a big time player and I can stay home at the University of Miami. I don't have to go uh, somewhere else uh, to play. And so the more we can kind of, you know, you know, hammer away at that, and the more the players can see that this can be a place where you can have success and meet all your goals, and, and that'll help us in the future. And this trend, and I think that's why it's point. Uh, it's important to put it in context of time, because obviously we knew that was really important four years ago as well, but some things just take time, and sometimes it just takes the persistence of a program to, to, to get it to where you want to. We're not all the way from a recruiting standpoint that we want to be, um, but some of the changes that we've made uh, in the last you know, almost 24 months uh, are paying dividends and, and we hope that they continue to do so. And we suspect that they will. I want to ask you too about the, the pass catchers you're signing, um, you know, within the context of college football is more and more becoming an offensive sport. Um, you know, the, the variety of, of skills that you've added with the pass catchers, with receivers and tight ends. Um, do you feel like this group has, has the traits to take things to another level in the future down the road? We, we certainly think they have the potential to. And, and I think you're right. You know, um, if you look at the NFL, if you look at college football, um, wide receivers can change games. And that's the, with what has happened in the RPO game, where really the only way about you can stop it is to, I mean, play man coverage or you have to play light in the box, which means you're, you're, you're down numbers to stop the run game in the box. And if someone's got to play man coverage to stop your RPO game, then, um, and they, they can't cover that guy man to man. You got a big time problem, or they got to they got to work the double guys. And and so, um, you know, adding the likes of a Romello Brinson and, and his ability to blow a top off of the coverage, um, you know, that transform you. A guy like Brashard Smith, who is is not just a great player, but in my mind, a game winner. I mean, did everything for Palmetto High School this year on their in their playoff run, except for paint the field and and and, and spit and you know like stir the Gatorade. I mean they. He's going, to, he's going to make a play somehow, some way through the course of a game that's going to help your football team win it. And it's usually going to be something pretty extraordinary of him making three or four guys miss uh, to do something that most guys can't do. And Jacoby George, who came to a camp, it was a seven-on-seven -seven camp here two summers ago, which feels like 20 years ago. And, um, I mean, nobody in the camp could cover him. You know, his ball skills were, were, were exceptional. And so, you know, all three of those guys, we feel like we can add in with what we have right now. And, 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 and they were all sold. Uh, Rob Likens and, and Coach Lashley did a phenomenal job. This was back in the summer when, you know, we were showing video of other schools running the spread offense that eventually we would become. And so I think seeing that and seeing Miami have the success, success that we had, the development of our wide receivers through the course of the season, um, I think really meant a lot to those guys. Uh, next, we'll go to Matt Shadell from Kane Sport. Matt, go ahead. Hey, Manny. Um, I usually only bother you with one question, but I got a, sort of a two-part of this time since it is signing day. Um, first of all, it, it's, it's somewhat unusual to have all the commits for the Miami Hurricanes stick. So congrats to you guys on that. Um, so I want to ask you if, A, if you felt COVID had a part in that, and B, if, you know, maybe you guys were concerned in the last week. Maybe you had to really pull this thing together in the last week. So that's the first question. And the second one's sort of related. It's about the, the COVID issue and, and more so how it relates to the high schools. Um, was there difficulty evaluating? I know you talked about 2022 and 2023. I want about if you could talk about 2021, was there difficulty evaluating the kids who made big jumps from their junior to senior seasons? Because usually there's a few of them that you offer late. You'll be like, oh my gosh, this guy really looks different, is amazing this year, things like that. And do you think those guys might have fallen through the cracks for everybody and might wind up at a, you know, a non-Tower 5 school, for instance, and just be a total stud? Can you talk about both those things, please? Yeah, I think uh, I'll answer your second question first. I think there's no doubt that there is uh, there, there will be some players in this class, not just talking for South Florida and, or in our little sort of fishbowl, but but beyond that will slip through the cracks. 
you could make the similar argument that the reason why maybe there, there may not have been so so many obvious ones that did make the big jump between their junior and senior year. I think of like a Brian Balaam a year ago, who thinks to be a great player for us um, because they lost all the opportunities to play. They lost spring practice. They lost a seven on seven circuit in the summer. They lost going to the camps and getting instruction. Uh, they lost a normal, you know, sort of high school training camp and jamborees and all those type of things. So you get better in this game by playing. And unfortunately, the high school coaches um, who are, you know, are always, you know, doing more with less down here uh, in terms of support. You know, they had to throw these teams together when they finally got the green light sometimes in, in, in October. I mean, they, you know, not knowing are we are we in, you know, the state playoff bracket? Are we going to opt out? I mean, there's, it was, there was so much uncertainty. So it was difficult. Um, I know, like you mentioned, Matt, about the, the 22s and 23s. But, yeah, I'm sure there's some 21s. We felt like our class, we did have a chance to watch our guys. Um, and and make the you know again uh, an evaluation to prove that we what we thought about them going into their senior year we still thought about them coming through their senior year and ultimately I think the way that the class you know came across the finish line reflected that uh, and then to your 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 previous point obviously this class had some drama way back when but really since um, I mean really since the summertime it's been as as drama free of a class as I can remember in my time at UM and. You know, how much of a role does COVID have in that? That's hard to say. Um, but again, certainly I, I give credit to the, to the to our staff and the relationships that they that they um, that they had. And then to the kids. I mean, ultimately, it's just it's these guys and what they what they want, you know, and, and, and they bonded tight together. And I think with with, you know, it's not just one great player that came. Um, there's a there's a bunch of them. And I think they 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 enjoy the company of being with each other and understanding that. Um, I don't know if they go somewhere and be the only great player. I, I can be in a class filled with, with dogs, and I think that's what they felt like. Uh, next, we'll go to Chris Stock from inside the U. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, Coach, going back to the receivers, you signed three this year, uh, four the year before, and, and then obviously you can have some returners. Just can you talk about the, the competitiveness that you're expecting from this group and, and you touch on it again with the offense that you're looking forward to having as well? And, and then another question, just – where does your class kind of go from here in terms of spots available? I know you touched on 24 the other day as a number, just maybe what you're looking for moving forward. Yeah, well, we hope for sure that not just at wide receiver, but at every spot, we're continuing to, to amp up the competitive nature of our football team. It just feels like, you know, looking back at us, the places where we've got more legitimate competition for playing time, the better we play, which just makes sense, right? So, um whether it's at the wide receiver room or you saw with the with the running back room and how those guys push each other throughout the year. I mean, I just that's what we're hoping to have happen all across the board. And that and the only way you accomplish that is one way. You got to stack big time recruiting classes on top of another. So we felt like we got a big one last year. I feel like this is a big time one this year. And we, and we will, you know, we're already starting the process to do the same thing for the 22s. Um, so yeah, so that matters. Your your second question was about oh the, the remaining four. So obviously there's some ones that we're waiting on. You know, and so and, and could get news, you know, as soon as tonight uh, or later this week, um, whatever we have left uh, through the turn. Um, there are some players who uh, aren't signing, you know, that, that, have, that have entered our attention, you know, that just became available for one reason or another. You know, certainly, of course, if there's a if there's a mid year guy that, um, you know, that we feel like could, could come in and, and help us. You know, we may have some flexibility with that. And then we'll do what we did last year is, is that there may be a couple of the ones we signed in February to really complete the class uh, position by position. So uh, we'll assess that as we find out exactly what we have, which I think we'll have a better sense of uh, at the end of the week. Uh, next, we'll go to Manny Navarro from The Athletic. Manny, go ahead. Uh, hey, Coach Diaz. Congrats on a, on a really good signing class. Um, I know all, I know all the recruiting victories feel good, but I'm curious about Leonard Taylor because I remember speaking to him in March right before the pandemic sort of shut everything down at, at, at the Under Armour camp. And I asked him about Miami and he's like, oh, they lost FIU. There's no way I'm going there. And in the middle of a pandemic, you, you, you change his mind. You convince him to come. Uh, how did how did you guys do it from your perspective? I think the only way you do it is just you have to be relentless, relentless in relationships, you know. And, and again, um, our recruiting staff, Todd Stroud, um, Ephraim Bonda, just have everybody on the defense side of the ball. Um, they were just relentless, you know, with LT. Again, LT is a guy that that I think we were his first offer. So we've known, we've known him. We've known his mom for a long time. And, uh, and you just stay after him, you know. And, and what we always say is, you know, trust, which is so important, trust is, 
is consistency over time, you know, being the same person over time. And, and, uh, and ultimately I think that's what started to, um, started to turn, you know, and obviously as, you know, as we got into the year and there were, there were some positive changes in our program and it just shows, you know, look, I mean, you know, there's going to be points where we stumble along the way. Obviously last weekend's an example of it, but, um, it doesn't have to define you. Um, it doesn't dictate your future outcome. And as, as you mentioned, if, if, you know, it, it seemed in March that there was one future outcome, well, we, here we are in December and it turned out not to be true. Um, and it's easy in recruiting to, to make big deals, you know, look at, look at James recruiting, you know, where that went and, and guys that, that, you know, committed to us early and, and then, and then looked around and whatever. And, you know, we're going to be who we are. We're going to be consistent and we're going to be relentless. And, and I think that's told the tale with not just LT, but with a lot of these kids in this class. And then the second question, you guys in the first two signing classes that you had there, Manny, I know the first one was kind of rushed, obviously, when you took over for Coach Rick, but 13 transfers, I think you guys signed in the first two, obviously none in this one. Do you feel now that you're kind of over having to rely on the transfer portal? And at this point, you know, is that sort of just to maybe address smaller needs? Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. You know, I mean, obviously we had to, there were some things that we were just addressing mm -hmm. um, through the portal. You know, some things that we were trying to to get fixed right away. Um, we're entering, the, I, I do have to say this, so we're, we're kind of entering a very unusual world of college football, you know, as the one-time transfer comes in. So it's going to be a little weird what, um, I think, I don't know if anybody in the sport really knows what roster management's about to look like, you know, coming up this spring. You know, again, as, as I mentioned in this setting before, um, there are no, right as of right now, there are no, you know, initial scholarships to give out for anybody in the country. The entire country is locked in to bring in 25 new players a year. And I, I would imagine probably at this point, there's probably already more players in the portal than there are spots to take them. So there's a lot of players right now that are jumping without a parachute. Um, so that may have an impact on everybody's roster that ultimately you may have to try to correct through transfers if, if um, you're given the, the ability to do so. So, you know, we're, you know, like I said, we're happy with where we are. Do we want to be a program that develops um, the best high school talent we can find, which we always think is going to come from Dave Broward and Palm Beach County, and then we'll spread out from there. But uh, but in college ball now, I think you got to have the ability to, to adjust as necessary with these new rules. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to David Ferrone. It's from the Sun Sentinel. David, go ahead. Hey, man. Yeah, to follow up on Leonard Taylor, and you mentioned James Williams in, in, in that moment, uh, that first moment where, where you kind of identified him as a freshman. Was there ever a similar sort of moment uh, with him, uh, you know, early on, whenever it may, may have been? And then I have another question after that as well. With LT? Yeah. Yeah, with LT, it was all the way back when he was at uh, at South Ridge. And, and then um, and then it, it was a camp. You know, you know, LT would come just to our practices, you know, when he was still at South Ridge and just be, you know, be around and, and then there was a camp performance, and it was again just <laughs> James. Obviously, is 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 just such a unique, you know, talent and in, in his size and, and the way he played the senior year at Heritage. I thought he even took his game to a different level. I thought the coaches there were fantastic with James. And but Leonard, I mean, you know, there's the big time defensive tackle coming out of South Florida. You just don't see those guys all that often. And we felt like we've got you know we're super excited about Elijah Roberts a year ago and. And LT, these people just don't, they don't exist all that often. There's a lot more great skill guys running around than there are the super big people. So to see a guy that can move like, like LT could and can uh, with his skill set and size is just very unique. And, and that's why, it, yeah, it was, it was pretty obvious early on that, that he was a special one. And I also want to ask about uh, linebackers and, and corners. Uh, your evaluation of the, the two linebackers you have here, Troutman and obviously uh, Tyler Johnson, Jaquan's brother, and um, uh, Malik Curtis, uh, same thing. And, uh, and the importance of getting more corners, uh, whether I don't, I don't know how many you're, you're looking for, but uh, to really complete this class, especially with uh, where you are numbers-wise on the roster. Yeah, we'll certainly look to add two corners to our football team, um, um, you know, before the season next year um, with Malik. We just felt like Malik could add some things that, um, you know, we, 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 we love the ones we have, the competitive nature of the guys we have, but we just feel like Malik can add a dimension, maybe a little bit different um, than some of the guys in our room, just, just with the, um, you, all you have to do is watch him on the field um, and his sort of game breaking speed, value in the, in the return game. You know, we, we're a little bit inconsistent in the return game this year that we feel like there are some guys in this class uh, that can help out with that because, you know, if you watch Malik return a kickoff or a punt, and he just chews up, chews up yards 
with that stride of his, you know, so he can really get out and run. Um, and then a linebacker, you know, I, I, I'm really excited about the young linebackers that we've added to our program really over the last three recruiting classes. You know, I mean, you know, Brooks, Huff, Austin Cave, Flag, um, and I, I, I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm missing guys even in that count, but like, but, you know, I, I feel like these, the guys we added this class kind of go in line with that. Tyler Johnson really can fe feature as a defensive end for us as well. I think he's got that flexibility. I mean, if you watch him in high school, he terrorizes people off the edge, and I think we got to give him a chance to do that here as well because that's such a unique skill set. And then Troutman, you know, instincts, quick decision making, and then a guy that doesn't run to contact, a guy that runs through contact. And, you know, just a guy, you know, some guys, it takes them a minute to kind of get linebacker because they got to they got to figure out all the reads. Um, not Troutman, man. He, he knows how to do it. He's been a great captain on that team, um, a leader for a really, you know, big time program in the Orlando area. So and then a kid that, that's so cool. He's a South Florida kid, knows a lot of the guys from from uh, the southern part of the county that are in our recruiting class. And uh, so it's kind of a coming home for Deshaun, the same as it is for Elijah Arroyo for, from uh, Texas. You know, so even two of our out of state areas are really, you know, 305 at heart, which is pretty cool. Uh, next, we'll go to Susan Miller Degnan from the Herald. Susan, go ahead. Hey, Manny. Uh, great class. I know at least I, one top player is waiting to announce later today. I know you can't talk about specifics. It, for coaches, is that still a bit nerve wracking until it actually happens or maybe it happen and you just wait until he announces? Can you talk about that first? And I have a follow. Susan, it is nerve wracking if a kid that tells you he's coming every day of his life and then you get on signing day and for whatever reason, you're waiting for the facts or now you can actually do it with a screenshot on your on your phone uh, until it comes in until they're signed. Uh, you don't ever feel, you know, like the game is won. I'll put it like that. So. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're 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 a lot of times, you know, waiting around just like you all are. And and uh, and, you know, you can feel, us, you know, good a certain way. But we've all seen, you know, I mean, certainly you've all seen even more than I have here, you know, high drama um, signing days that, that go the way you don't want them to go. So um, if you can get one to go the way you want to go or get a one without drama like we've kind of had today so far, uh, there's there's a lot of merit in that. So it's pretty fun. OK, that's great. And then also, can you describe that? I mean, you have been describing it, but this class, if you, when you go home tonight and if it all ends up the way you want, in a, just a sentence or two as far as the big picture for you, the overriding theme, what gets you most excited about this class? They love Miami. Like I said, I don't know, I don't know the exact number, but I bet I bet 85 percent of them were committed before we played a game coming off of the six and seven from a year ago. And you add them to the ones that committed to that signed with us this day last year when we when we just lost to FIU and Duke. So there's something about them. They believe in what we're doing. Uh, they believe in this place. They believe in, in, in what it means to be a Miami Hurricane. Um, and then they're really, really talented. And and, uh, and they're tight. They want to come in. They want to go right to work. And, um, and like I said, as, I think as a coaching staff, we can't wait to get them in here. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Gabby Urtia. Gabby, go ahead. Hey, Coach. Um, I, obviously, you're going to get a, a few of these guys in next month, January, like as early enrollees. Just kind of talk about the impact of that. It seems like you might get a, a decent amount of them in there. So just, you know, how big that is for them, their development, and especially maybe getting a guy like Leonard Taylor, who's probably going to be there next month. We're hoping for double digits. I don't know exactly which guys for sure, you know, will be in. I mean, part of that is going just going through the admissions process. But we're hoping, <clears throat> excuse me, Again, to get double digits in here, um, but man, just hoping for a regular offseason, right? I mean, how cool would that be just to have a proper offseason program, a proper spring practice? I mean, that's the part that kind of breaks my heart for the 2020s. Um, just so much of their development was stunted by not having a, a real, you know, even the mid-years, not having a real January to, to July. So to get these guys in, to get them, you know, they obviously know a lot of the guys on, on, on our team right now. Uh, to get him into our building, get him in the locker room, get him with David Feely um, in our offseason workout uh, conditioning program. I think we'll just it, it'll it'll be it'll be so important for them um, to be able to impact our football team next year. And then even the ones that, that can't come till summer, there's always some some that are in that in that boat. Uh, sometimes because of the, their school, and that's fine too. Uh, but we'll we'll get them in here in May, and, and and again, even just have a proper summer. You know, we can get you know eight or nine weeks of of running and conditioning. And the players can do seven on seven on their own. I mean, it's just, it's just it'll help us out immensely. 
And then just uh, one more thing about Elijah Arroyo. I know you just touched on him. Um, just seems like kind of like a freaky talent at tight end. A lot fits, you know, a lot of what you guys already do with the position. Can you just kind of expand on him a little bit more? I like your words. <laughs> you asked me, you got, you got the, I like freaky talent. I mean, that's what it looks like. I mean, you got, you watch a guy on film. I mean, every, it felt like the guy scored four touchdowns every game and, um, and not just, you know, like where they leave the tight end wide open, you know, when you when you run the uh, tight end corner route from the two yard line. I mean, I'm talking about like down the field, lining him up as an X receiver, lining him up in the slot. He's, you know, he's running post, you know, getting past safeties. Then he's catching the ball in the middle and breaking tackles and, 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 and scoring long touchdowns. So, Yes, I mean, I, I think it's not hard for him to imagine, for us to imagine, um, you know, all the different ways that you can, you know, line him up. You see all different ways we use Brevin and Will. And then when you, met, you know, factor in Khalil Brantley, just the same, a, a very, a, another very unique skill set, great hands, great ball skills that you can use and utilize in so many different ways. So it'll be fun to have the two of those guys uh, coming together and, and, and just give us options of how you can line up on, and present problems to a defense. Great, got time for a few more. We'll go to Gary Furman from Kane Sport. Gary, go ahead. Hi, Manny. The uh, the coronavirus kind of necessitated a little bit of a change. Uh, well, not change, but an adjustment in recruiting philosophy for you, uh, focusing almost entirely on South Florida with a couple exceptions. Uh, do you see this hopefully starting a new trend for you? Do you see getting back to a more traditional um, recruiting philosophy of you know venturing out more upstate and outside the state? Or, like, was this a game changer for recruiting philosophy? Gary, right? Gary, I, I would push back on that notion a little bit. I don't think coronavirus – I think our philosophy was set before March, before the pandemic ever hit. I mean, we've known – you know, those, those of us on the staff that have been here over the past few years, I mean, you know, we've been talking about this 2021 class since they were in ninth or tenth grade. I mean, everyone who came down here to recruit knew – that the 21 class was going to be special in South Florida. And, and we didn't get them all. We're you're never going to get them all. But it just felt like this year we, we you know, because of, of, of everybody, you know, on this staff's efforts, uh, we got a lot more than we normally got. And it just happened to coincide with a big-time year in South Florida. So um, plain full stop, that is our recruiting formula for success. We always, always want to win Dade and Broward and Palm Beach County first. We have just not always done that. And because we did it this year, we're not guaranteed to do it at the same clip, you know, in the following years. But we will always begin here. Uh, we'll always push out to I-4 uh, from there. And then we'll always push up throughout the rest of the state and, and nationally if it's guys that are the right fit. I mean, that's just – that's who we're going to be. It's what's won here in the past. And and But like many things, it's it's simple, but it's not so easy to do. And and, and sometimes it takes, you know, a few years to kind of crack the puzzle and or to crack the code and, and – uh, and I do think it's it's we, we're we're getting better and better at it, and 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 hopefully, you know, the last thing I'll say about it again is that is that hopefully the 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 the, the twenty twos and twenty threes and even twenty fours watching this class sign, saying, oh man, I remember, I'm in ninth grade now. You know, I'm watching uh, Romello Burns every day in practice. I mean, he's the best player you know I've ever seen. I want to I want to go where he goes. You know, or I'm at Miami Central. I want to go where Lawrence Seymour went because he made that decision. You know, I'm, I'm a ninth grader at Palmetto. I'm going to go, I want to go to school where Brashard Smith went because, you know, what Brashard meant to me. So just those are the, the ways that – and I'm, those are just a handful of guys I'm talking about. Those are the ways that you can change, um, you know, the, the, the course of, of recruiting. You know, I mean, we're to sign two kids from Columbus High School. I mean, that's a big deal for us. Um and there may be a, a ninth grader at Columbus now that maybe even no one knows about. So that's going to help us down the road of laying the foundation for our future local recruiting. And then as an extension of that, I mean, college football recruiting has always been coaches flying all over the place, hundreds of thousands of dollars in travel costs spent, uh, you know, coaches having to be away from their families for a month and, 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 and things like that. Do you see the way recruiting has gone this year? I mean, it, it's marched onward. Uh, every school is going to have a full signing class. You know, some did it like you and did it regionally, but some of the other teams around the country still were able to recruit nationally. Do you see this maybe altering things a little bit in, in that sense to where, you know, coaches aren't traveling constantly all the time at this time of year and schools maybe aren't spending as much money as they were spending and, and those sorts of things? 
No, Gary, that's a, that's a great question. You know, and will things go all the way back to the way that they were? Um, I, I could see there could be some potential for some adjustments and some change. I mean, some things like to your point that you had to have that you didn't have and everybody still signed a class anyway. But I'll still say this 21 class was unique because they had probably still been places. You know, certainly a lot, all of these guys have had, had been around us and been on our campus. And we had a chance to evaluate almost every one of them in person. Um, the 22s and 23s don't have that advantage. And so I do think there are some things that, you know, we, you know, whenever, you know, the, the pandemic subsides that we do need to get back to normal, just, you know, because, you know, we really won't know until we see what, you know, three or four years from now and how you evaluate all the 21 classes. Um, and do we have an advantage because of being local and, and, and our kids having been on our campus and knowing who we are and, and at a different level than, you know, if you're recruiting somewhere from far away. So, um, I suspect maybe some things won't exactly be the way that they were, but right now that's kind of apropos for college football because I don't think, I mean, every, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of change going on and, uh, and we're kind of, you know, we're sort of building the bridge as we're crossing it.